Good morning. My name is Charlie, and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome everyone to the Kronos Group's first quarter 2019 earnings conference call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Anna Slimak, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you for joining us today to review Kronos Group's first quarter 2019 financial and business performance. I'm joined by our Chairman, President, and CEO, Mike Gorenstein, and our CFO, Jerry Barbato. Earlier this morning, Kronos Group issued a news release announcing our financial results, which are filed on our CDAR and EDGAR profile. This information, as well as the prepared remarks, will also be posted on our website under Investor Relations. Before I turn the call over to Mike, I'd like to remind you that our discussion during this conference call will include forward-looking statements that are based on assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected in the forward-looking statements. Management can give no assurance that any forward-looking statement will prove to be correct. Forward-looking statements during this call speak only as of the original date of this call, and we undertake no obligations to update our, or revise any of these statements except as required by applicable law. Management refers you to the cautionary statement and risk factors included in the company's most recent MDNA and annual information form, by which any forward-looking statements made during this call are qualified in their entirety. We'll now make prepared remarks, and then we'll move to a question and answer session. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mike. Thank you, Anna, and good morning, everyone. In the first quarter, we took important steps to fortify our foundation for success and value creation, both in the near term and long term. We believe that we have created the building blocks that will enable us to capture the significant growth opportunities in the global cannabis market for the benefit of our shareholders. I would like to start the call by discussing the investment by Altria before moving on to the business highlights and turning it over to Jerry to discuss the financial performance. We are very excited to officially have closed the previously announced $2.4 billion investment from Altria in March. We dedicated a lot of time and effort to close the strategic transaction because we are confident Altria is the right strategic partner to have in our corner as we grow and push our business forward. We are already tapping Altria's expertise in innovation and product development and look forward to continue to work with them. With Altria's backing, we expect to be better positioned to capture opportunities and accelerate the execution of our strategic initiatives. As an adult use innovation leader, Altria's investment enables us to leverage their product design, manufacturing, marketing, and distribution, and commercialization capabilities. Altria also has significant expertise that can serve as a foundation for cannabis vape products, as well as considerable experience with large-scale manufacturing automation, pre-roll technology, and supply chain management. Like Altria, we believe that the best way to create value through the supply chain is by working with contract farmers and not being farmers ourselves. This belief is why we are working to expand our production footprint globally by setting up co-manufacturing with agricultural partners, and we believe in the future Altria can be helpful in these efforts given its own agricultural relationships. Another key benefit is the decades of experience that Altria brings in successfully navigating complex regulatory landscapes. That expertise, which spans taxation, product registration, shipping, licensing, government and regulatory affairs, and other legal issues will be critical to Kronos as cannabis markets develop, legalize, and open around the world. We are excited for the many opportunities we expect this relationship to create. Already, we are beginning to see the benefits of Altria's expertise, which has been instrumental in putting our strategies in motion. For those who are new to the Kronos story, I'd like to start each call by briefly reviewing the four key aspects of our strategy. At Kronos Group, we are establishing a global production footprint, which we believe will be instrumental in creating an efficient supply chain for the future. We are developing a diversified global sales and distribution network. We are creating disruptive intellectual property. And further, we are growing a portfolio of iconic brands and products that resonate with consumers. During this call, we will do a quick update on each aspect of our strategy and what we were able to achieve since our first fourth quarter earnings call. In the Canadian market, our wholly owned licensed producer and center of excellence, Peace Naturals, and specifically Building 4, our state-of-the-art purpose-built 286,000 uh, square foot indoor facility, is continuing to come online. As many in the industry have noted, the time it takes to get licenses and approvals has increased. We are awaiting licenses in the last remaining flyer rooms in Building 4. We still expect all flyer rooms to be populated in the first half of 2019, 
and we are constantly working on dialing in efficiencies and improvements in yields towards full run rate capacity in the facility's future. We're also seeing progress with our production joint venture in Colombia. In March 2019, a wholly owned subsidiary of Natuera received a license from the Colombian Ministry of Justice and Law to cultivate psychoactive cannabis in addition to its existing licenses to cultivate and manufacture non-psychoactive cannabis and products. This license will allow for the cultivation and the manufacture of derivative products. Although we have received this license for psychoactive cannabis, our initial focus will be more heavily weighted towards growing hemp and CBD-based production. We are in the process of working on the design of the production facilities with our partners and will provide more information on the status of this facility as soon as we have more definitive designs to share. We continue to expand our distribution footprint in the Canadian market for the adult use channel. In January 2019, Kronos Group secured listings with a number of private retailers in the Saskatchewan province. Together with our currently established distribution in Ontario, BC, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, we have secured listings in five provinces, which represent approximately 58% of the Canadian population. As our Canadian production capacity grows and comes online, We intend to strategically increase distribution within existing markets and expand into additional provinces and territories in Canada in a calculated and methodical manner. We want to make sure we can adequately supply our current footprint on an ongoing basis before expanding to new markets. In January, the Israeli government approved the export of medical cannabis from Israel. This law will allow medical cannabis license holders who meet specific quality certifications to export medical cannabis. We intend to pursue export of medical cannabis products from Israel once production operations have commenced at our facility. As a reminder, Kronos Israel is Kronos Group's joint venture with the Israeli agricultural collective, Kibbutz Gan Shmuel. Kronos Israel is focused on the production, manufacture, and distribution of medical cannabis. The greenhouse and manufacturing areas of Kronos Israel are in full construction mode. We anticipate that the construction of the 45,000 square foot greenhouse will be complete in the first half of 2019, and construction of the manufacturing facility will be complete in the second half of 2019. Kronos holds an effective 90% economic equity ownership across the entities in Kronos Israel. This week, we also launched Kronos Device Labs, an impressive R&D facility with certain assets purchased from Altria Israel to accelerate our development of disruptive intellectual property. Kronos Device Labs is focused on supporting the development of next-generation vaporizer products. The -the state-of-the-art facility will serve as our global R&D center for vape technologies. The experienced team of 23 people is comprised of product designers, mechanical, electrical, and software engineers, and analytical and formulation scientists with extensive experience in vaporizer development. We know that the vaporizer space is one of the fastest-growing and evolving categories, with many consumers migrating to this convenient, non-combustible consumption method. At the same time, the category remains in its infancy with few products that are specifically tailored for cannabinoids. These products are even less developed in delivering full spectrum effects in a consistent and controlled manner. At Kronos, we are using the plant as a blueprint to learn and then create differentiated active ingredients. We will do this by reconstituting cannabinoids and terpenes in combinations that have specific psychoactive effects and or potential therapeutic benefits. We then formulate those active ingredients to optimize bioavailability and customize them for the appropriate delivery systems depending on the product. And Kronos Device Labs is specifically designed for doing just that in the vaporizer category. This new initiative is expected to significantly enhance our technology and development capabilities and ultimately, we believe, allow us to deliver expanded consumer product offerings specifically tailored to cannabinoid use. We know that vaporizers will be an important product category and one that we are committed to leading through innovation, research, and product development. To conclude this call, I wanted to talk about our efforts and responsibility and our commitment to consumers and all of our key stakeholders on this important topic. In April, our adult use cannabis brand, Spinach, partnered with Arrive Alive, Drive Sober, and Fedora to encourage responsible, sober driving. Every dollar raised goes directly to the campaign's road safety initiatives. The campaign works with police services, public health units, schools, community groups, and businesses to help spread the message of safe and sober driving through resource sharing, public campaign and awareness events, and Spinach is committed to advocating for responsible adult use to raise awareness about impaired driving. We are confident that we are positioning the company for long-term success by investing in innovation, 
in responsibility, and ultimately in our business. Our strategy is focused on long-term sustainable growth, and we believe what we are building will continue to resonate with consumers and will generate long-term shareholder value. With that, I'll turn it over to Jerry to provide a discussion this quarter's financial results. Thanks, Mike, and good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be part of my first Kronos Group earnings call. Both our press release and MD&A include comparisons of our financials to the same period in 2018. Currently, we believe the best way to evaluate our business and the industry is a comparison on a sequential quarter basis. The industry has gone through substantial change since the first quarter of 2018, primarily driven by the opening of the Canadian adult, adult youth market. With that said, I will focus the majority of my comments discussing the first quarter's performance versus the fourth quarter of 2018. We also believe adjusted EBITDA is one measure along with the fourth quarter of 2018. We also believe adjusted EBITDA is one measure along with net revenue kilograms sold, and average selling price to evaluate the operating performance of the business. Adjusted EBITDA removes the impact of items that may distort underlying business trends and results. We have included a reconciliation of net income to adjusted EBITDA in our MD day and our press release. The company reported an adjusted EBITDA loss of $8.9 million in the first quarter of 2019. The loss increased by 13% from the fourth quarter of 2018, primarily due to increased operating expenses, partially offset by an increase in net revenue. The company reported net revenue of $6.5 million in the first quarter of 2019, an increase of 15% from the fourth quarter of 2018. This increase is primarily due to two factors. First, dry flour wholesale revenue in the first quarter which carried no excise tax reduction for 2019. The sequential growth continues to be impacted by the supply constraints in the market. As Mike mentioned, we expect to have additional production capacity online in the second half of the year, as we balance meeting demand today with focusing on the long-term strategy of our business. As we continue to invest in our business, our brands, and R&D initiatives, our adjusted EBITDA will likely decline over 2019 but position the company for accelerated growth in 2020. Kilograms of cannabis sold increased 7% to 1,111 kilograms in the first quarter of 2019 from the fourth quarter of 2018, primarily due to increased cannabis production. As we look to 2019, we see that quarter over quarter increases will slowly scale in the first half of the year as we ramp up production and with momentum for revenue growth building in the second half of the year. Average selling price for the first quarter of 2019 increased 7% to $5.73 from the fourth quarter of 2018. As previously mentioned, this is primarily driven by the increased revenue resulting from CBD oil, which carries no excise tax reduction. We believe gross profit before fair value adjustments provides useful information to understand and evaluate operating performance by excluding the non-cash fair value adjustments associated with biological assets and inventory. Gross profit before fair value adjustments for the first quarter of 2019 was $3.5 million, an increase of 42% from the fourth quarter of 2018. This sequential increase in gross profit before fair value adjustments was largely driven by an increase in kilograms sold and a higher average selling price. For reasons already discussed, as well as a reduction in cost of sales before fair value adjustments per gram, our fully loaded unit cost of goods sold. Unit cost of goods sold decreased by 11% to $2.69 in the first quarter of 2019 from the fourth quarter of 2018. This was primarily driven by productivity gains realized in our cultivation operations. Operating expenses for the first quarter of 2019 totaled $13.9 million, representing an increase of 12% from the fourth quarter of 2018. The increase is primarily driven by professional fees for services in connection with various strategic initiatives and increased staffing levels across all functions within the organization, in line with the company's growth strategy. In order to carry out our 2019 strategic objectives, we will function functions 
over the course of the next three quarters. Additionally, in March 2019, Kronos Group sold all of its approximate 19% equity interest in Whistler Medical Marijuana Corporation to Aurora Cannabis in an all-share transaction. At closing, Kronos Group received approximately $24.7 million in value of Aurora Common Shares, which the company subsequently sold for approximately $25.6 million in cash. Subject to the satisfaction of certain specified milestones, the Kronos Group expects to receive an additional $7.6 million in value of Aurora Common Shares. Based on market conditions at the time of the transaction and assuming all milestones are met, Kronos expects to generate, in aggregate, a return of 8.7 times on its investment in Whistler. You'll also notice that on a reported basis, the company reported a significant increase in net income due to various one-time items which are described in the MD&A and the financial statements. I would like to comment on one of those items. Altria's investment included a warrant and other financial derivatives that allow Altria to acquire additional shares in Kronos Group. Kronos Group will record these financial derivative liabilities at fair value each quarter. As such, there may be significant reported earnings volatility, primarily driven by quarterly adjustments related to the movement of Kronos Group stock price. In the first quarter, Kronos Group recorded a non-cash gain of $436 million related to the change in fair value of these financial derivative liabilities. We've included additional disclosures in the financial statements regarding the investment, the accounting treatment, and the impact of the financial derivative liabilities. Turning to the balance sheet, as of March 31st, the company's total cash position was $2.4 billion. In addition to providing us meaningful liquidity, the Altria investment affords us the flexibility to capitalize on opportunistic external growth opportunities and accelerate organic growth initiatives. I would like to provide some insights into the short-term use of funds received from Altria in March. As we continue to scale the business for future success, we will increase our capital investments related to production, specifically as it relates to our Peace Naturals facility expansion and automation equipment, GROCO, and Israel facilities. As you are aware, the pending regulations related to the legalization of derivative products, which include vaporizers and edibles in the Canadian adult use market, will require increased investment as we work our way through 2019. Additionally, the launch of our vaporizer innovation center in Israel, Kronos Device Labs, will require investment to develop next generation technology for cannabis and cannabinoid vaporizers. This concludes my review of the financials for the quarter ended March 31st, 2019. I'll turn it over to Mike for closing remarks. Thank you, Jerry. In closing, the business in the first quarter of 2019 performed in line with our expectations. We continue to stay focused on creating a leading cannabis company that is well positioned to capture the expanding global market opportunity by building our supply chain, distribution, intellectual property, and brand portfolios. We're delighted to have officially closed our transaction with Altria and to kick off a relationship we expect to drive significant growth and value creation. This investment, as well as numerous other actions taken in the quarter and the quarters to come, will provide a strong foundation for Kronos Group. Let's now open the line for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press a star, then the number one key on your touchstone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, press the pound key. Please be advised to limit your question to one question and one follow-up only. Our first question comes from the line of Tam Chen with BMO Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my first question is, um, just wanted to talk on the inventory for a second. Um, I noticed that the finished inventory was a bit modest at the quarter end with more of it was a work in progress. And just given the time that it seems to take now to convert harvest and unfinished product into the finished packaged goods, I'm just wondering how should we think about you know, the sales ramp for the next quarter and even for the second half of 2019? Yeah, thanks for the question. I wouldn't read too much into one quarter's activity. You know, as we mentioned on the call, our production at Peace will continue to ramp up over the course of 2019. 
and we believe that harvesting more kilograms each quarter would naturally increase our work in process. And given that it takes about 45 days for WIP to go through drying, curing, and testing before it can be bottled, the work in process increase is further pronounced by this gestation period. Okay, thanks. Got it. And my follow-up is I'm just wondering on the um, the Israel uh, R&D Center, you know, why there versus elsewhere? And can you talk a bit more about what you mean by next-gen vapes? Uh, as I think there are some vape products that exist today with some level of metered dosage. So is it that it's a new type of oil formulation, or is it new additional features or technologies on the pen itself that you're looking to develop? Sure. Uh, thanks. You know, why Israel? I, I think, really, we look at Israel as a global leader in cannabis research, and, you know, we already have production operators there with Kronos Israel, uh, partnership with Technion for preclinical trials for skin repair. And, you know, one of the things that was important to us is making sure that we could, we could accelerate this initiative. And so we actually took over the facilities and employees from, uh, you know, former Ultra entity, Ultra Israel, so it's not a greenfield operation, but it's a, a fully established R&D facility with technology, equipment, and talent that's already intact. Uh, and, you know, we think that the best course of action is to use our own R&D capabilities to develop uh, the vapor products. But uh, I think when you look at what's out there and you think of how these devices have come online, it's important to look not just at what the, the device itself is, but how that device is developed in, you know, in connection with the formulations. So what we've seen in other areas that, that the formulation tying into the heating coil, understanding how to adjust the temperature control, uh, tying that into meter dosing, how much uh, vapor is being released, depending on what your consumer target is, whether that's uh, you know, a, a large amount of vapor being released versus a smaller, softer amount, really can affect what occasion you're targeting. So I, I think it's putting all those together and taking those building blocks, combining that with you know, understanding what the spectrum of cannabinoids that we're using are, uh, whether that's primarily a, a THC or CBD-based uh, formulation, or whether that's really making sure that the, the heating points are, you know, preserving flavor and really getting the, the most out of the, the rare cannabinoids that we're using. Having that, you know, that platform technology in-house and being able to iterate uh, across vapor and flour, I think, is very important. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Carey with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, so I, I guess just from a capacity standpoint, right, so you did about, uh, roughly 1,000 kilos in the first quarter and, 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 and have or are working toward approximately 40,000 kilos in the near term. I mean, you know, how soon do you think that gap can close, right? Um, and, and what really needs to occur for that to happen? Is, um, is it that the, the Canadian supply chain, you know, you need more distribution points to start to open up? Um, do, do you need more export markets to, to start to open up? Um, so I, I wonder if you could just uh, provide some uh, perspective on that. Sure. As far as, uh, as far as capacity, we expect that everything planted – uh, in the second quarter, and then it's, it's really a matter of just continuing to dial things in as we go. Uh, you know, as, as far as distribution points and how we work through the supply chain, you know, I, I think it's a big factor here is going to be what those ultimate formats are. So, you know, you'll start to see also, uh, you know, how we allocate and for what product formats, and that's really going to affect what the, what the filling, packaging, and, and shipping is. So I, I think... You know, you'll see a lot of that uh, towards the end of the year with the, you know, expected and planned change in regulations for what products we can release uh, start to open things up. And we expect that, you know, that may have an even bigger effect in, in terms of opening the types of products than just the number of uh, distribution retail points that open up. And that's a very important market for us. So making sure that we're prepared, you know, is, is a real, uh, real big initiative for us. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so, uh, you know, just just more broadly, right? So you've got over two billion dollars on the balance sheet. Um, you know, and, and we've recently seen in the market, you know, there are ways to create value um, that maybe aren't so obvious in in, in a number of. Uh,
Your next question comes from the line that Vivian is there with Cohen. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Uh, my first question was on, um, Mike, your comment on Columbia and your decision to prioritize um, hemp over marijuana. Can you just offer a little bit more color on what informs that and how you're thinking about and markets and market sizing? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Vivian. So, you know, a lot of what we're looking at is, you know, is ease of import export. And, you know, while, you know, we, we still will use and maintain the psychoactive license when, when we look at, uh, you know, at regulations for different product categories and we start thinking of kind of the three main distribution channels, you know, on one end you have traditional ethical pharma, uh, and, and you have pharma regulations on import export. It's kind of what you see in, you know, in Germany. Uh, you know, all the way on the other end you've got, of the spectrum, you've got recreational, where it's extremely difficult to import export. You know, this middle category, whether you're thinking of, of things opening up for, you know, for the farm bill, or you know, what we expect the, to happen with CBD in the EU over the next uh, next 18 months, we see borders falling much faster for uh, non-intoxicating products primarily that are CBD-based. Uh, so having a scalable uh, production base or input for CBD is something that's important, and I think that that market globally is going to expand probably more rapidly than the THC market just based off of the ability to import-export. Uh, you know, otherwise, a lot of that product will likely be uh, shifting towards some you know, domestic production for for adult use. Thanks. And just just to follow up on that, then, in terms of kind of capabilities around, you know, finished goods, is that something that you want to bring in-house? Because, you know, at least based on what we're seeing in the U.S., delivery formats for CBD have been highly varied. How are you going to address that? Yeah, I think it really depends on, on which format. So there are certain formats that it certainly makes sense to, to bring in house. And I think the more specialized and, you know, the more, uh, the more we feel we need to, to be able to have control to ensure that we've got consistency, uh, you know, quality and safety, we'll be bringing those in house. And then I think there are others where we feel that along the value chain, we can, uh, we can use co-packers and co-manufacturing. So depending on the type of, uh, say, oral ingestible uh, versus vapor, where you know we know there are are sophisticated and highly experienced uh, partners that we can leverage, we certainly will do that. Uh, I think it also depends on which geography you're looking at, whether or not it's uh, us shipping in uh, ingredients and then locally manufacturing versus being able to ship uh, final product. So I don't know if it's as simple to say all in-house versus. Uh, all contracted. I think it really depends on on which geography and ultimately which product. Okay, that's helpful. And just my my last one, um, you know, on your comment around um, you know expanding your distribution and presence in Canada as you get more supply online. You know, clearly there's a balance between going deeper in the provinces um, where you're already present versus expanding into other provinces. And I just wanted to hear kind of your expanded thoughts on that, Mike, because you've had a bit more of a nuanced view around um, kind of the the ability to brand build so early in the market. And so you know, does that inform how you think about that that choice, um, breadth versus depth? Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's a great question. I think when we look at, at, you know, normally your issue is when you launch a product is trial. How can I get someone to try Try a product. Given how how much of a shortage there is, I think right now it's really about driving repurchase and trying to get as much horizontal uh, or I should say virtual shelf space as you can right now. Launching a lot of SKUs across the country, you know, really when trial isn't isn't a problem, doesn't necessarily help for repurchase if you have stock out. So our preference is to be able to have. You know, in those provinces, the ability to start building up relationships with customers, be able to continually, you know, uh, drive repurchase, and then expand from there. Uh, I think also, again, when we think of formats in different, uh, you know, different categories and allocating supply, we want to make sure that we can uh, still fill a pipeline for you know, new products that come online, and follow that same strategy that we'll have enough 
inventory, knowing that there is a, a quick supply ramp for us to be able to make sure that in other formats where we think it's easier to build brand equity across Canada, we're, we're really able to make sure that we, we get uh, repurchases after trial. Perfect. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Martin Landry with GMP Securities. Your line is now open. Hi. Good morning. Um, I just want to come back on the uh, on the inventory balance, uh, Mike. In, in Q4, you had alluded to um, some some bottlenecks or challenges in, in downstream and, and processing and packaging. I was wondering, you know, um, as the situation improved, have you resolved these bottlenecks, or, and are you do you feel more comfortable with with your post harvest um, capacities? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, I think that's something that is resolving and that we're working towards, but is is not uh, fully resolved yet. And I think, you know, as we're we're continuing to ramp, it's something that we think should be resolved uh, over the next uh, next few quarters. And it will it will likely come in different formats at different times. So, you know, we, we focus on making sure that we're able to automate and you know in one category. Uh, while still making sure we have some product going out the door manually and others. Uh, but it does take time to set up all automation lines for all products. Uh, but, you know, we do see, we do see that continuing to improve and ramp and, you know, we're, that's, that's really being accelerated by a lot of help we're also getting from pretty experienced, uh, packaging engineers and automation experts from Altria. Okay. And, you know, given that your finished good levels are, are at similar levels as they were in, in December, um, you know, should, how do we look at, at revenues for Q2? Should, we, should that imply that um, your Q2 revenues are, are, are likely to be stable uh, versus uh, Q1, or, or you still expect some growth there? Yeah, I think it should be relatively stable. You'll see some growth, but, you know, as we said earlier, we're really planning to ramp up um, finished goods in the back half of the year. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of John Santaro with CIBC. Your line is now open. Hey, thank you. Good morning. I um, wanted to ask about capital allocation. Uh, so similar to, to a question that was asked previously, uh, and, and my apologies, I, I may have been cut off from the call briefly, but uh, Mike, you've, you've been clear that you want to prioritize R&D and intellectual property and that you're looking to avoid buying business plans. Um, but I'm wondering what, what are your thoughts on quality and valuation of assets in the U.S. market, and would you potentially look at an acquisition that gives you optionality in the U.S.? Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think the, when, when I talk about business plans versus businesses, a lot of that, uh, you know, does relate to just general maturity of the business, whether, you know, specifically it's I've applied for a license, uh, do you want to buy my business versus we've built up uh, a community and we have, we have really strong relationships already built with, uh, with customers. I think that those are, are, you know, one of the things we look at in the U.S. is having that having that relationship, having, you know, real velocity on a brand that we look at as valuable. And, you know, I think, you know, footprint and distribution versus versus brand is something that, you know, we do feel we have strong relationships already built in the U.S. on the on the distribution side, but brands are, are something that's important. And I think that you can find still good value. Uh, you know, you certainly have to look at where growth is going to be coming and sort of, you know, project forward a little bit. But I, I think that it's still available. Uh, you know, certainly regulations will play a very, very big factor in uh, in how those brands and those businesses continue to grow. And you know, I, I wouldn't say it's specific to the U.S., but we do still see that there are a lot of uh, a lot of different in innovation initiatives uh, kind of globally that certainly have value. And you know, we do think about speed to product development, and generally what is disruptive and scalable. Uh, so that, regardless of borders, will always continue to be at the top of our priority list. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Uh, and my follow-ups on Kronos Device Labs. Um, it, I just want to make sure we're right to interpret this move as Kronos being interested in not just the vaporizer space, but technology that focuses on, on the rare cannabinoids that you're looking to generate with Ginkgo. Is, is that fair? 
that's that's one hundred percent fair. I think you know again when we whether it's edibles, whether it's capsules, whether it's vaporizers, you know, depending on the cannabinoid, you really want to tailor the delivery system you know, to the experience you're trying to create. So we put so much time and effort and thought into how to combine different cannabinoids and terpenes to create experiences. And in order to maximize that effort, it's important that the delivery system fits in with the uh, cannabinoid formulation that, you know, that we put in. Also on that is, I think from a brand perspective, and, you know, as we gain insights from ethnography studies, ultimately what that device could be may be very different depending on the cannabinoid formulation just in terms of form factor. And, you know, when you compare uh, cannabis vaporizers to, say, tobacco vaporizers, it, you have a much bigger range of uh, what consumers want. So, you know, you know, one vaporizer may be may score very high in a focus group for uh, for adult males, but score very low for adult females. And then you'll see something that's completely reversed. And I think it's important to have a suite of products that address different consumer need states versus trying to have one size fits all. Okay, that's a great color. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Bottomley with Canaccord Annuity. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just wanted to touch uh, briefly on the strategy for, for launching derivative products. Hopefully, uh, you know, industry-wide by Q4, we'll start seeing those roll out. Um, just going back to your, to your inventory balance, not to, not to beat a dead horse, but how should we look at your strategy with respect to kind of selling everything you can, given that there's a bit of a product shortage, um, you know, countrywide? versus stockpiling a bit for a Q4 rollout. Do you think it's important to, to hit the ground running in the vape and edibles or whatever the categories are? Um, or are you kind of, you know, playing it, uh, you know, purchase order by purchase order now as the, as the market evolves? Thanks. Uh, you know, I think right now it's certainly a balance between selling everything you have and making sure that you can load for launch. But you know, a lot of the work that we've done, a lot of the data we've been collecting over the last few years has to do with, with post-processing. And one of the reasons that we've been hesitant to accelerate third-party purchasing uh, and, and, you know, contract growing for flower-based products is it's really diff difficult to get a consistent product if it's not the same genetic or grown in-house. Uh, for, for vapes, you know, there's a lot of we can do to bring in biomass or third-party extracted product and then, you know, re-inject or recombine different uh, terpenes and cannabinoid mixtures to have something that's actually standardized and then release. So, you know, given that, I think it, it allows us to actually accelerate and be a little bit more uh, aggressive and we think vapes, you know, as a category, it's very important to us and uh, making sure we're able to, you know, to launch with a uh, significant inventory is is something that we are continuing to prioritize. So, uh, you know, I think that when you when we think of the categories, we're certainly hoping by June we're going to you know have the the regs uh, you know publish and go final. And assuming that's the case, uh, we will start to be uh, quite aggressive in making sure that we have uh, pipeline of products. Great, thanks. And then on the other side of things, just on the retail side. Just wondering if there's any, uh, you know, highlights or updates on, on your relationship with MedMen or even outside of that, um, you know, how that, that tender process might be going, if there's certain provinces, maybe Alberta, where you think you might have uh, stores open. Sure. So it, it's still an extremely strong relationship. You know, I think at the end of the day, the cannabis business is, is a relationship business, and, you know, we've looked at the relationship with MedMen always as something that would would start in Canada and expand globally, so we still continue to work with them. You know, what we've seen, and this is, is certainly no secret to, to any industry observers, is that uh, right now retail licenses certainly have slowed down. Uh, we do sort of have, and it's a little of a chicken and egg problem, uh, but, you know, as infrastructure needs to come online, it's important to, you know, to watch how licenses are handed out. We, you know, we're hopeful that by the start of next year, we'll start to see more licenses in Ontario. Uh, one of the benefits of the MedMen partnership versus us starting a, a new brand is, 
you know, we don't feel that the same urgency to, to try to get brands on shelf to create brand awareness is something that we face with MedMen. Uh, we still look at it as the most established retail cannabis brand, uh, really by far. And so we feel that we can wait until we can deliver a, a customer experience that's you know, as close to the customer experience you'd have in a you know, MedMen West Hollywood store. And I think being able to do that once value-add products are online, once supply starts to catch up, uh, we don't feel that there's any disadvantage by not having you know, one of the earliest licenses, given, given how strong the brand continues to be. Great, thanks. Uh, I know there's only two questions. If I can just put a housekeeping item in there very quickly. Um, are you able to disclose your um, percentage of uh, revenues this quarter that were to Germany versus Canada? Yeah, I think you should have uh, we should have international broken out. It's in the should be in the financials. Okay, apologies. I'll look at there. All right, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Graham Kreindler with Eight Capital. Your line's now open. Yeah, hi. Good morning, and thanks for taking my questions here. Uh, the first question I had, I just wanted to get an update on um, progress at GroCo, and considering the announcements out of Health Canada yesterday and changing in the licensing, um, if that would have any effect on the timelines. Sure. Uh, yeah, progressing progressing quite well. I think it's uh, it's a, a large enough structure that it's. Uh, it's Certainly, quite public uh, as to you know where it is progress-wise. Uh, as far as the announcements yesterday, you know it, it's something that we we already have a application in for, so you know we don't know that it would be have much of an effect uh, one way or the other. We're we're hopeful that uh, not just for Grow Co, but also for you know other initiatives we have that uh, this will have the effect of streamlining the licensing process. I think that there were a lot of applications going in, and we think that anything that would uh, anything that suggests service standards or kind of reallocating resources uh, and prioritizing you know, prioritizing applications that Health Canada believes will uh, imminently lead to more supply would be something that's more of a benefit to us. So we're we're certainly optimistic, and we're really pleased to see that there is a conscious effort being made to make sure that. You know, the program runs smoothly in Canada. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, just another question here. I wanted to follow up uh, on the Columbia assets and with respect to uh, growing more hemp there. Um, just wanted to get a, a bit more clarity. You know, fr from my understanding, um, there's a lot of supply of hemp biomass available in Canada, and that continues to increase in the United States. So with respect to the amount of supply that's out there in the market and focusing uh, on growing that in Colombia, is there a, a significant cost advantage that you're expecting by focusing on, on the cultivation there? Thanks. Yeah, I think, I think there is, and it, it's not unique to hemp, but really to, to generally just agricultural products, uh, labor, climate, uh, the number of cycles you can get per year, you've, you've got a pretty big advantage in Colombia overall. Uh, so, you know, I think that's certainly a driver. And you know, when you start looking internationally, and again for the, the deregulated space, we do see that uh, having a low cost of production is going to be something that's, that's going to be really important to drive margins long term. Okay, great. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Albert Wurtzheimer with Nois Research. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Rob Wurtzheimer. Is this me? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the intro was confusing. Um, so just a couple, uh, uh, Rob Wertheimer, Emilius Research, just a couple of questions. Um, on your comments on, on vapes, I just wanted to understand the time frame a bit. The ability to sort of buy in biomass and tailor or recombine, is that a statement that applies, you know, in the near term to 4Q, 1Q, 2Q kind of thing, or would that take longer to do? And then maybe just commenting on the time frame on differentiated devices in the same vein. Sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, that certainly does apply. It, assuming again, this is is really, uh, I'd say all plans are contingent on on how regulations develop. But it's, you know, assuming that we're able to uh, have the derivative market open up, 
We think that there, there is a secondary market that's starting to develop and that there is availability. Uh, as far as, as far as devices, we look at that like other, you know, if you think of generally how consumer hardware works, it's, it's really iterative. So it's not, uh, it's not something where we're going to wait, you know, wait years to have the end product. And it's something that we want to continually iterate and make sure that we're constantly improving. So you'll see, I think, multiple product lines, but that is a, a long-term ongoing uh, initiative where we think that the device market will become increasingly competitive and being able to iterate uh, is, is going to be important. And I would contrast that with, with what you see in the nicotine device market. And it's important to remember that uh, it's very difficult to launch new nicotine-based devices because of the FDA restrictions and needing to apply for approval. So we, we think that you know, because of uh, using that as sort of one device being locked in isn't necessarily going to be applicable and a good comp for how things will develop in the cannabis-based market. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. And if I may, just to, just to follow up on dry flower is the same kind of time frame as you get into more harvest uh, coming out in 4Q or, or shortly thereafter. Um, you know, market's been in shortage. Maybe there's less of a shortage by then. Who knows? Are you confident that you have the customer base and, and um, shelf space or distribution, whatever you want to call it, to sell through all the increased production? Is that obvious to you, or will it be a competitive fight at that time? You know, it's it's certainly hard to predict, but, uh, you know, I would say that 4Q, we think we're, we're still extremely confident. Uh, we do believe, though, that the principles of supply and demand will 100% apply to Canada, whether, you know, it's, it's talked about or not. It, it is inevitable. I think our model, certainly being a little bit more asset light and not, you know, focusing on trying to be vertically integrated, uh, does rely on the assumption that supply will catch up with demand, and we do expect that competition. Uh, as that continues to happen in the flower category, you know, one of the things that we would expect will happen, you know, in terms of differentiation is understanding how to, you know, still change format. So, you know, being able to have unique pre-rolls and make sure that you have some brand element, being able to work on standardization and consistency there and genetics will, will really be, I think, what wins. We're also seeing a lot of the you know, a lot of the brand selection right now is based off of strain, which, again, supports the importance of genetics. Uh, so, you know, it's really a, a long-winded way of saying in the short term, absolutely, but uh, there, is, there is demand and there is still a shortage. But, you know, there's been a lot of capital that's important. There's a lot of planned projects, and we do think that it will become competitive. Uh, but it, it's contingent upon execution, you know, across the industry, which is always hard to predict. Uh, thank you much. Your next question comes from the line of Ryan Tompkins with Jeffries. Your line's now open. Hi, all. Yeah, I was just um, looking to ask a little bit around the derivative side of things. Um, I know it's been asked about, but in terms of actual facilities or processes, um, and just on that, whether Israel would be up and running and contributing to any sort of products that may be on the market come October, um, or whether that will be after that. Thanks very much. So, I, you know, I think there is a number of, uh, of different products that will be released, and, and we wouldn't expect the full suite to be something that's released Q4. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of the formats, you know, we're still trying to understand what the final regulations will be in terms of uh, packaging specifically for edibles. So, you know, we do still have facility space that is allocated that will allow us to, you know, enter certain categories. But as we see, you know, the market and regulations develop, you know, we, we expect to, uh, you know, to be able to continue adding to the product line. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Shane Laidlow with Hedgehog Ridge Management. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, guys. Thank you very much for the question. I uh, don't mean to beat a dead horse here on the derivative products front uh, within the Canadian market, but just wanted to ask kind of a follow-up question on if you could add a little bit more color. You just mentioned uh, you have facility space, but if you could add more color on kind of what additional investments from a kind of manufacturing process and machinery perspective that needs to happen, and, and maybe if, you, if you're thinking about any specific categories that you're more focused on than others, whether it be beverages, edibles, or, or, or the like, uh, that would be very helpful. 
Sure. So, you know, uh, to be to be more direct, I think you could expect us to, uh, in the early days, prioritize vaporizers first. Uh, I think that, you know, the regulations around vaporizers are, you know, we feel that those are much more likely to stay the way that they are today versus sort of iterate and change over time. You know, edibles is, is for us, it's really about, you know, understanding what those final regulations are and, and how we launch products and specifically in what categories. Outside of Canada and thinking longer term, you know, you'll see us in a lot of different categories of oral ingestibles. I'd also say topicals is, is an area that we're focused on, uh, you know, even, even sooner than just the research we're doing, you know, on skin in Israel. Uh, but Canada specifically, you know, the regulations that at least were, were proposed were different than what we've seen and been able to pull data from in the U.S., uh, you know, packaging sizes, how that affects pricing, overall demand. So, you know, before we put a significant amount of capital investment into unique packaging automation, we want to make sure that we know what the final regulations are so that we're not, you know, taking up space and, and commissioning equipment that is for uh, single-serve single, single serve packaging only to find, you know, a few months later that that changes over uh, to something that we're more used to in terms of multi-pack. Uh, but again, prioritizing vape, we feel there's more certainty and continuing to have the platform technology that allows us to move quickly and be flexible as we see the edible you know, regulations published is, is what we're working on. Great. Thank you for that. And then just moving to Ginkgo Bioworks and uh, biosynthesis more broadly, um, if there's any kind of color you can share on progress being made there and also uh, thinking about kind of the broader market and how biosynthesis is uh, the space in general is being more talked about and I think more accepted over time, uh, kind of versus last summer where no one was really thinking it was like a, a viable solution longer term. So if you could just talk about kind of how that kind of space has evolved in your, in your mindset from a competitive standpoint and if you have any color on the progress, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think of all the initiatives we have, we still continue to be extremely bullish about the partnership and, you know, working closely with Ginkgo. Uh, you know, while we won't go into specific details on the technical milestones we've hit, you know, you can see the R&D payments in financials. We've, you know, we've been hitting milestones and continue to be extremely impressed and uh, with, with what Ginkgo has been able to do how quickly they're able to do it, and generally just the breadth and, and depth of their platform. Uh, as far as competition and things heating up, I can say that we, were, we, again, feel very fortunate that we were sort of looking at this very early compared to the competitive set, and we're able to have our first choice of partner. Uh, you know, it, it's really not a surprise. I think that if you looked back a few years, people thought of biosynthesis as sort of futuristic Star Trek-like idea where you know, oh, it, it'll happen in five or ten years and, you know, we'll figure it out. And I think now the entire cannabis industry is accelerating and people are starting to look for, you know, how will cannabis be disrupted, not just how will cannabis disrupt other industries. And as that happens, you know, companies start turning towards biosynthesis. So it, it does in some ways validate the thesis. Uh, we still that we feel that we have a very strong advantage, you know, with Ginkgo being you know, by far and away the leader in synthetic biology. So, you know, overall confident, but we do expect that this space will increasingly have focus, you know, as, uh, as the science is more and more understood. Great. Thank you very much. We have no further questions at this time. I will now turn the call back to the presenters. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, and have a good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. Have a wonderful day.